<laughs> no. <laughs> Good morning, folks. Look who I brought with me today. Ah, oh, what a wonderful morning. What a great time of worship. Hallelujah. I surrender. I surrender. Yes, what a powerful song to enter into our time together on. I surrender. Hallelujah. I love that, that, that verse that popped up, humble yourself before the Lord. Uh, resist the devil and he must flee from you. Draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Welcome, friends. It is Palm Sunday. Good morning. You know how this works. We're going to take the next few minutes to greet one another. Uh, just pretend you're walking around the sanctuary hugging people. And for you that hate hugging, uh, just just uh, relish this wonderful time where you get uh, where you, where you get to pretend to hug. Amen. So find somebody on there. Just say hi and uh, and uh, say hello, honey. They want to hear from you too, so you can Good pop morning. up. How are you, today? <laughs> you see, say hi to Justin. There's, just, there's your course. friend Pam. Uh, Pam's on there. Arnetta says hi, Pam. She can't read from where she is. She's old. <laughs> Hallelujah. Melody and Kelly and Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Kelly Strange. There's your cousin, dear. Your cousin's Good morning, wife. Kelly. Peyton's here. Hey, beautiful, uh, uh, I don't know what they call that, your Facebook picture, profile picture, uh, Peyton. That was an awesome picture to put up there. Good morning, everyone. Daryl Beetle, Shamika, Jean East, Dave Scranton. I assume Mary's with you there, Dave. Hi, Mary. Vicki Humphrey, good morning. Oh, Jack, go. Jack said hi. He's trying to jump in on the game here. He's still trying to figure out why we sit at the table and talk to the computer. Good morning, Melissa Mannion. Good morning, Aaron. I assume Kelly's there with you. Hallelujah, Megan and Wanda, uh, Georgia. And I'll assume Ron is there with you, Georgia. Pam, Alicia, Dave Peters, and I guess Karen's been with you. I keep saying hi to Dave, and I never say hi to Karen. Good to see you, or not to see you, <laughs> you Karen. Good to be with you this morning. Ah, there's my cousin Paige. Love you, sweetheart. Good to see you. Oh, man, there are so many. Amanda and Tyler. Hey, give Amelia and Benjamin a big hug for me. I miss Amelia so much. She's come in on Friday mornings and see me and and uh, pull all my stuff, all my shelves in my office. And I miss her so much. Amen. Uh, so anyway, Jerome, Jerome said hi to Jack. Hey, Jack, you weren't left out. Jerome said hi to you. Jeremy and Laura, good to see you. Bill, Candy, so many. Wow, what a wonderful time it is. What a beautiful day out it is. Strangest Palm Sunday I've ever been through, but I choose to believe that the truth behind Palm Sunday is all still there, man. God is still God, and I'm not. Thank goodness. Amen. All right. So anyway, I brought our in to look at you and say hi. She's just playing on her I'm trying to thing get over there. So anyway, she's trying to get it to log up. Kim Crassel, hello, hello, hello. I'm so happy everybody's here today. Hey, if I miss your name, scroll by. Don't get mad at me. Hi, everyone. I don't want to miss anyone, but these things scroll by fast, and sometimes I miss some of you. But welcome, all of you. Amen. Mackenzie, good to see you. Amy. Good to see you. Uh, oh, man, it's just so happy. What a great time. Jeff Oberling, Jeff Oberling. Brother, I'm kind of sad if you all are still moving at the time you think we're never going to get to worship face-to-face -face again. So anyway, uh, Mary Stark, good to see you. There's my buddy Mark Mason accusing me of laying bricks on the, on the basketball court, but I'm going to forgive him anyway. Steve Potter, well, he's not lying. I laid some bricks on the basketball court. Ah, uh, Ruth McReynolds, Lonette, Randy, good to see everybody. Wow, what a great time. Grant Sherman, just had a talk with somebody yesterday. We were talking about what a great man you are, Grant. You, uh, <laughs> they, they, they said it, and I agreed 100%. So just now you're wondering, what were you talking about before, Pastor? It was all good, brother. Anyway, Dina, good morning. Rich Cedarwall, all right, Rich, we'll see how long you can stay in before your internet starts kicking in and out. 
Roxanne, I'll zoom down and Eric are with you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right, we're going to open with a word of prayer. Find your seats. <laughs> Amen. Quit your hugging. It's time to pray and seek the Lord. Hallelujah. Our Nana fulfilled her responsibility. She did not want to come sit in front of the camera, but I told him, hey, everybody wants to hear from their uh, from their from the first lady, right? Rich is here, so we got to get the title right. Everybody wants to hear from the first lady, so. Anyway, thank you for sitting in, honey. Would you bow your heads with me? And let's just open with a word of prayer this morning. And just in faith, reach out your hands and hold hands with somebody. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we've come into this place today. We've gathered in the name of Jesus. And your spirit brings us together as one. We are one today. There are no limitations uh, because your spirit is within us and brings us together. And we have come to worship your name. We have come to lift up our hearts thank you for the worship time that we just had oh for the beautiful music and those who wrote it and performed it and god now we just want to come to your word with open hearts and want you to speak to us god speak life to us in the name of jesus as we praise your holy name be with us today in jesus name we pray Amen. Amen. So good to have everyone here. We're going to get right to the word this morning uh, because we're going to do some different things. We're going to share the word and we are going to share communion. So uh, I just want to I want to encourage you to, to focus in here on the word of God over the next few minutes and let's allow him to speak to our hearts. Amen. Aren't you thankful for this technology? Amen. Aren't you thankful if we're going through this that uh, we can at least have some way to stay connected? And uh, I am so grateful for it and, and love the opportunity. I tell you what, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 today. But before we get to our actual scripture, because we're talking about it's Palm Sunday. So we'll talk about the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Our focus this morning, our the theme, if you could say the, the title of my sermons is Focused on Victory. Because I believe that's kind of the message, uh, one of the many messages that we can take away from Jesus' triumphant, uh, tri triumphant entry uh, into Jerusalem, triumphal entry, however you want to say it. But um, we are going to focus on victory this morning, the Word of God and what it has to say about focusing our attention on history, not on history, on victory how many are focused on the victory, right? Let's not focus on the problem. Let's not focus on the disease. Let's not focus on what we're losing out here. Let's focus on the victory that is ahead of us, the victory that is happening even in our lives today. God is changing me. I'm going to come through this whole thing more like Jesus. My friend, I said it Friday night. I said it earlier this morning. I'm going to say it again. Man, if you don't come through this thing closer to Jesus, if you don't come through this thing changed, you have missed an incredible opportunity. Opportunity, but we're going to agree together that we're coming through this thing a little bit more like Jesus and more effective and as, as disciples for his kingdom. So before we get to the actual story of, of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, I want to jump back a few chapters to Luke chapter 9 and just one verse. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 51 says, As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Resolutely. That means with a purpose, with a focus, with a passion. He had his eyes on the goal, and he was not going to let anything distract him from where he was headed. He set out resolutely towards Jerusalem. And why? What was the purpose for which he had locked in his attention upon Jerusalem? Well, I'm here to tell you that his purpose that he was locked in upon Jerusalem, my friend, is because in Jerusalem laid his very purpose for coming to the earth. His very purpose for taking on flesh and bone and becoming like one of us awaited him in Jerusalem. All of the other things he did were preparing his people for life beyond what was going to happen in Jerusalem, preparing them to take his glorious message to the rest of the world. 
but his main purpose for coming to the earth awaited him in Jerusalem. And when he sensed the timing, when the Spirit nudged him and the Father said, go, he set out resolutely towards Jerusalem. You know why? Because he was going there to fix me. He was going there to fix you. He was going there to fix broken humanity. He was going there to provide us a way back to our Heavenly Father, and nothing was going to deter him from the goal. Hallelujah. What a great message this morning, my friends. All right, now we're going to jump forward to Luke chapter 19. And uh, every now and then you might type, type an amen. I can't hear you. So you, know, you might type an amen in there for me. All right, here we go. Luke chapter 19, verse number 28. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem. Still hadn't lost focus, right? There was a lot of things that were happening on the road to Jerusalem. Ten chapters <laughs> of stuff going on. Ministry continued because Jesus always had time for people. He continued to heal. He continued to teach. He continued to pour into their life. But then he said, it says Jesus went on towards Jerusalem. Even that ministry was not going to deter him from the goal. Right? As he came to the towns of Bethphage and, Beth, Beth, Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Okay, so he lands and Bethphage and uh, Bethany. These, this was the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So think about that. Lazarus was there to greet him. Lazarus was there to greet him. Maybe the Father's way of reminding him. I want to take you through Bethany to remind you that I bring people out of the grave, son. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a reunion that must have been as as uh, as Lazarus saw him coming. I don't know. I never really thought about that till I was reading through the story. And I thought Lazarus would have been there to, to greet his Savior. What a beautiful thought. But there he was. He was focused on Jerusalem. So let's pick it up again in verse number 30. And he tells his disciples, this is what he says to them. Go into that village over there, he told them. And as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever written, ridden, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say the Lord needs it. Now, I kind of love that story. Well, let me read on. I want to get a few more verses. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, what are you untying? Why are you untying that colt? That's a good question, right? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. Wow, hey, go over in the city next door. There's going to be a Mercedes Benz. The keys will be in it. Just jump in and bring it back to me. <laughs> there you go. But he tells them, here's what I want you to know from that. Jesus knows what lies ahead on the journey towards the goal. Okay, Jesus was on a journey towards the cross, correct? Because there he was going to accomplish the purpose for which he came to earth, which was to fix broken creation. Jesus was on the journey. He knew the details, not just the general idea that, hey, I'm going to wind up in Jerusalem, but he knew every single detail that was coming. My friend, I want to encourage you today. Because I want you to know that Jesus is still on a journey today. His journey was the cross. Now his journey is the propagation of the gospel through his church. He lives through us. And the ultimate goal is when he will come again. And I want to tell you something, my friend. Everything that happens between now and his second coming, which is rapidly coming to us, I believe, he knows the details. He knows the details. He knows the details of what are going to happen today, tomorrow, and the next day. One of the things is we watch the news and the things going around us. Everybody's looking for an answer, right? They bring the doctors and they bring the politicians and they're bringing all these people in. And thank God for some of these doctors and these scientists that are helping us. And I believe they've been a blessing to us. Um, but none of them have answers, right? I mean, in the end, they have some answers. Those are good things. But you know, how long is this going to last? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. We can, we can, we can, 
We can want and, and long for that time, but nobody knows. But I'll tell you what, who does know? Jesus knows the details of your journey. Jesus knows the details of my journey, friend. He knows. And so what did the disciples do that had to seem a little strange? Hey, go down into Jerusalem and take that donkey. Now, it might have been a little bit different in Eastern culture. Things are not the way they are here in a collectivist culture. So that may not have been as radical as an idea as we would think it correct. But it was still a little out there, right? I mean, the owners still wanted to know where they were going with their donkey. But what did they do? They did the only thing we can do. They just did what he told them. They just obeyed him. See, we don't know what the details are. They didn't question him really about the details. They listened. He told them. And he went. They went. And they did what he told them. You see, my friends, our focus and our attention right now as followers of Jesus Christ is just to do what we're told to just obey the Lord Jesus and do what he tells us, even when it doesn't make any sense. They just obeyed. We don't know all the answers, but we serve the one who does. He still has a mission. The mission is that his gospel will be preached in every nation, and then the end will come, and he'll come back for his church. That's our Jerusalem, right, is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows every detail on the journey. Let us just be committed to obey in the same way that these men were committed to obey. So let's pick it up again. I love doing this just verse by verse, letting the scripture speak to our hearts. Verse number 36, as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It was a time of celebration. Here come their king. It says they were rejoicing in all the things that they had done. John said that Jesus did so many things. You know, we just had a little bit, 45 days of Jesus' life is all that's recorded in Scripture. That's it. He was here 33 and a half years, and 33 of those years, and, or three and a half years in public ministry, and John said if everything that he did was recorded, we could fill an entire library, right? And they were thinking of all these things that they had seen him do, and they were rejoicing. And I want to tell you what was behind it all, is they were convinced that today was the day that he was their Messiah, and he was coming, and he was going to ride that donkey into Jerusalem, and he was going to throw out the Romans and set up his kingdom, and they were going to be Israel again, and they were going to be reestablished as a nation again. It was a day to celebrate, and his disciples were thinking, regardless of all the warnings he had shared with them, his disciples were thinking, Man, this is it. I'm going to be the Secretary of State, right? And I'm going to be his Chief of Staff. And, and they're all excited and they're worshiping him. And they're caught up in the emotion of the whole thing. Jesus doesn't rebuke them. Jesus doesn't rebuke them. It's a day of celebration. They were, they were, they were uh, longing and assuming that their, their liberation was near. Here's the thing that I wanted to share with you. We often don't realize the details of our own journey, right? We often don't realize the details of our journey. My friend, that's why it's called faith. I don't understand even what we're going through today, but this isn't the first time in my life I've been in circumstances I did not understand. I've spent a majority of my life even as a follower of Jesus Christ, in circumstances that I don't understand. That's why we call it faith. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I cling to the fact that Jesus is returning for me. 
And that is my sustenance when I don't know what's going on. I cling to him and I obey and I look forward to the day of his coming. I want to set out resolutely for his kingdom, for the time of his coming. That's why we call it faith. You know, often there's huge gaps that we don't see on the journey. Those of you in Bethel, there's a lot of you that don't come to Bethel. I'm so happy to have you here. And those of you at Bethel, just uh, oblige me for a minute as I, uh, uh, as I share this story. But uh, God told me when I was 28 years old that I would that I would be the pastor of Bethel Church, right? 28-year-old young man, and I was excited and waiting for the moment. What I couldn't see is that I would be 57 years old before I actually became the pastor and the dream was fulfilled. I didn't see the 15 incredible years that I had in Elmwood, but boy, I wouldn't give up those years for anything. I couldn't see the seven years uh, in China. I couldn't see the three years starting that new church in Farmington. I couldn't see the new friendships there in, in, uh, in Kiwani, though a brief time. I couldn't see the years as a car salesman, right? I couldn't see myself out peddling Schwann's ice cream. But I wouldn't trade one of those things because he knew where I needed to be and when I needed to be there. My friends, we don't always know the details. We just know that if we hang on to him, he'll get us where we're going. Hang on and obey. Just do what he wants you to do. Just do what he wants you to do. What's he want me to do, Pastor? Well, when you're in doubt, love God and love others. That's it. Until you get any further instructions, live every day to love God and to love others. Let's pick it up in 39. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And them Pharisees were wet blankets, self-righteous wet blankets, right? So full of themselves, uh, couldn't stand somebody else getting attention. Rebuke your followers. And I love Jesus' response. He says, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road will burst out, burst into cheers. Listen, what do you mean? God's will is going to prevail. He can do it with us or he can do it without us, my friend. But God's purpose are always going to be accomplished. Nothing the Pharisees can say is going to stop them. You can silence the crowd, but it's not going to stop the will of God. My friend, there was people in that crowd who a week later were standing in the same crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him. But nothing could stop the will and the purpose of God. Jesus was not driven by the praise of the people. He was driven by the will of the Father. And he kept his eye upon the goal. Listen, God's will will always prevail. So just walk in the center of it. Stick with him. Stick with him. No matter what it looks like, my friend, stick with him. Because he's going to get you through to the other side. He has great plans for you. He has great designs for your life. He has the ultimate reward is our eternal life. But I want to tell you what, he's got plenty of rewards along the way. There's some suffering. There's some hardship. There's some difficult times. But I'm going to tell you what, every one of those things lead to us being just a little bit more like Jesus, and it's worth anything, my friend. Hallelujah. What a powerful, powerful promise. Now, we come to another part in the story. From Bethany and Bethphage down into Jerusalem, it's he had to descend down the mountain. I got another sermon I preached many years ago, so descending into the greatness, but he had to come down the mountain, down the Mount of Olives, and then to Jerusalem. And as he came, at some point, he hit a place. It was like a scenic pull-off that you get in the mountains. And there was a place where he had a beautiful view of the city of Jerusalem below him, and he stopped. And this is the record of what happened when he stopped. He said, but as when he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, ahead he began to weep. The time of celebration had come. The time of celebration had gone. He stopped and he overlooked the city and he began to weep. And he said this, 
how I wish today that all of you people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Jesus' heart was broken as he overlooked the city of Jerusalem. Because I said Jesus knows the details of the journey. And Jesus could foresee that in less than 40 years, the Romans would invade Jerusalem, totally ransack the city, destroy it completely, and they would disperse the Jewish people out of their homeland and disperse them throughout the world. And for the next 1900 years, the Jews were a homeless people. It happened because they refused to recognize their God. They had turned their back on him, killed the prophets that, they, that, that God had sent, including his only begotten son. And for 1900 years, the Jewish people were dispersed amongst the nations of the earth with no hope, with no home. My friend, can I share something with you? When I talk to people who don't believe in God, I'd like to ask them, explain the Jewish people to me. 1900 years, these people had no home. They had no identity. And yet, 1948, they came back to, to Israel and began to repossess the land. Still their identity intact. I don't know any Hittites or Perizzites or Haggites or any of the other ites recorded in the scripture. Because when nations were dispersed among nations and their identity was stolen, they disappeared. But it never happened to the Jews, my friend. And that to me is the greatest physical evidence, physical evidence. I have a whole lot better spiritual evidence, but to me it's the greatest physical evidence of God's existence. Here's the thing, in 1967, they finally came back into the city and repossessed Jerusalem, beginning a prophetic time clock that's going to lead to his coming, which is fast coming upon us. He cried over Jerusalem. My friends, in the coming days, this coming week, we are going to celebrate and remember the most important week in the history of the world. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think we have a unique time this week, a unique opportunity to celebrate the events of this week. The calendars have been cleared. Some of you are still working, I know. But you don't have to run home in the evenings and take the kids here and run there and do this and do that. We have a unique opportunity this year to celebrate what's going to the, the, the events of this week. It'll culminate, just to kind of give you an idea where we're going. Every day at 9 a.m., we're going to meet, uh, and we're going to walk through some of these events. I'll open up the scripture. We're just going to walk through some of the events. We can't cover all of the events of that week, but we're going to walk through some of them. Every day at 9, except Tuesday, we'll be here at 7 p.m., and Friday at 7 p.m., we're going to have a good Friday service where we're going to come together and we're going to remember the most important event in history, the crucifixion of Jesus, where God fixed a broken world. And then I'm going to ask you to do something. 
I have no way of knowing. This is between you and God. But I, I believe that this is the Holy Spirit's leading. And I'm asking you Saturday to turn off the computer, turn off Facebook, turn off the television, turn off technology, turn off the noise. And I'm going to ask us to spend a day in silence this Saturday. To just spend a day in silence. If possible, to fast. And just spend a day in silence as we remember the day, the days that Jesus spent in that tomb. And then Sunday morning, we're going to come together to celebrate the resurrection. You see, Jesus' purpose was found in Jerusalem because Jesus' goal, his heart, was focused upon the cross. And this morning, we're going to do what Jesus asked us to do in remembering what happened on the cross. We're going to share communion. I got the word out this week. I hope that you're prepared. We're going to share these emblems that represent Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. My friend, if you're not a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're kind of left out of the ceremony. This is for family. But can I tell you, you can be part of the family. It doesn't. It doesn't require any memorization. It's just an act of faith. I believe in you, Lord Jesus. Even in the midst of all this chaos, I believe that you love me, that you died for me. And I want to be one of those disciples that follows you. As we come to this time, I'm going to pray. And then we'll begin to participate. We will begin to to celebrate the communion together. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray if there's any out there that are unsure of their relationship with you, that even as I pray right now, your Holy Spirit would prompt in them the faith to trust in you, a recognition of their brokenness, and a realization that you are the solution. We come to this table in reverence and awe. And in just a few days following the story that we told, Jesus sat down. Wasn't it interesting that the last, one of the last things that he did was his disciples was sit at a table and share dinner. And at one point during dinner, he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Jesus did what he did for you, for you individually. He would have done it all if you were the only one that would ever believe and receive it. He loves you that much. This is his body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's participate in the Lord's body together today. Hallelujah. Thank you for your broken body, Lord. And then he took the cup. So this cup is the blood of a new covenant. A new covenant that we have with Jesus. Or whereby we are saved by faith. Uh, by grace, through faith, 
in him. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission with sins. And without the remission of sins, there is no relationship with God. There is no finding your destiny. There is no finding your purpose on the earth. And there is certainly no salvation that will lead you to an eternal life in his presence. But his blood purchased all of that for us and rescued us from a damned eternity, from an eternity separated by, from God. This is his blood. It was spilled for you. Let's do this together today in remembrance of our Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord. We bless you, Father. We praise you, O God. You are a great and awesome God. And we worship you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and all of our strength. God, I bring to you today each and every person that is hearing my voice. And I lift before you not only them, but every care, every concern, every anxiety, every fear, every need that they carry with them this morning. And we bring it boldly before the throne of God. We pray for their healing. Physically. Spiritually. Psychologically. Emotionally. We pray that you would provide for those who are facing difficult financial times. We pray that you would give peace to those who are struggling and that you would bring your presence to the lonely, those who are all alone and feeling the despair of that separation. Let them know that we are never alone. Touch every heart. Bring hope and remind us of your promise. I've got one more passage that I want to share with you very quickly, my friends. And it comes out of Revelation chapter 19. You see, Jesus came once humble and on a colt, a donkey. But he's coming again. And in Revelation 19, a lot of people are wondering about end times. I don't think coronavirus in itself is a direct fulfillment of any scripture that I see in the Bible. But the principle and the things we see going on around us in the world today make it evident that his coming is near. This is a good time to be thinking about it. But this is how he's coming eventually. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, that'll be us, my friends, will already be there with him at this point. Dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. 
He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. My friends, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Be ready. Be ready. Hallelujah. Father, take this word, divide it into their hearts, Holy Spirit, and help us to incorporate this word into our hearts and our lives, to learn to walk in obedience to you because you know what lies ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to take a minute before we sign off, just a couple things to remind you of. Uh, you have been very faithful in in remembering your uh, in remembering your giving. Uh, please continue in that. Uh, the bills keep coming for the church, but you have been. There's a couple ways you can do it. You can go to the church's uh, website, BethelQuincy.com, and if you just give on the click on the giving link, it will walk you step by step through it. There is a video that I made on our on our um, on our face the church's Facebook page. It'll if you need a little help, it'll help you. Uh, or you can mail checks either, uh, let's just say you can mail them to the church, uh, 839 South 12th. We're picking up the mail a couple times a week. So 839 South 12th, you can mail those uh, those checks there. Um, so I would just appreciate if you'd remember your ties. Uh, there's a lot of you out there that don't uh, necessarily attend Bethel Church and you're joining us. And we're not asking for anything from you, if you wanna, if you wanna help during this time, you're, you are, you are welcome. But uh, there's certainly no pressure there. Um, and then I want to remind you. Finally, I've told you about our schedule for our Bible studies each day uh, at 9 a.m. Except for Tuesdays and Friday, Friday this week at seven at 7 p.m. Also, every day uh, I'm kind of hosting a prayer time, okay? And what happens is I log on at the beginning of the hour. We kind of set the stage for 10 minutes, and I'd log off, and we pray for 40 minutes, and I uh, come back on about 10 till the hour, and uh, and we close out together. At Monday, we're going to do that at noon. Tuesday, we will do that at 7 a.m. Wednesday at 7 p.m., Chance Gooding will be hosting that one. He hadn't told me he would yet, but he is. And then Thursdays at noon and Friday at 9 p.m. I got to tell you, Friday night, for those of you who were there Friday night, it was a powerful, powerful, powerful time. So join us for the prayer times. I really want you to, to um, focus in this week. You've got a great opportunity before you. Um, and I want to stress our silent Saturday. It's just something the Lord laid on my heart this morning as I was preparing. If we could just spend the day in silence, um, turn down all the noise. I'm not even turning on the radio, no music, nothing. Um, and uh, we're just going to spend the day in silence before the Lord. I don't think I've ever done that. And so uh, I'm going to encourage you to do it. And then next Sunday... Wow. Next Sunday, we're going to start at 10, but I'm going to do like I did today. At 10 o'clock, I'll come on and I'll introduce the worship songs. We'll pray together. Then we'll log off long enough to actually go through those worship songs. And then I'll come back when they're over 10, 15, 10, 20, whenever uh, those songs are finished. So anyway, I love you. Thank you for checking in today. May God bless you. He is with you, my friends. Fear not. Fear not, for the Lord is with you. May he bless you and be gracious to you and make his face shine upon you. We are going to be transformed. We're going to come through this thing better than we came into this thing. I love you so much. It's my honor to serve as your pastor. God bless and have a wonderful day.